Okay. Um, so the announcements this morning, um, it says today there's a hayride and, and a picnic at Trinity Woodward at three o'clock, but it's post a rain date. Post yep. So the rain date is October 1st. Um, September 27th, the soup kitchen at St. James United Methodist Church in Coburn and to contact Paula Smith. The Secret Power of Kindness is a book study via Zoom on September 28th. Um, you can sign up at pennsvalleyparish.info. September 30th is Paradise Cemetery Workday and volunteers are welcome starting at 8.30 a.m. October 1st is World Communion Sunday. October 3rd, Spruce Town United Methodist Church Ad Council and Trustees Meeting at 7. All are welcome. October 5th, Ladies Coffee and Conversation at St. James in Coburn at 9.30. All ladies welcome. October 18th, our charge conference is at 7 p.m. at Spruce Town United Methodist Church. Members, please attend. October 22nd, Spruce Town Church Homecoming and Luncheon. Worship, 11 a.m. lunch following. The guest speaker is Georgine Searfoss. Robert Steiger's family historic documents will be on exhibit. October 25th, Soup Kitchen at St. James UMC Coburn. And November 4th is our Fall Bazaar at Spruce Town United Methodist Church, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Gently used items, crafts, and more. Homemade soup and baked goods. Uh, great for Thanksgiving and Christmas shopping. Are there any other announcements? Then our centering words, the God revealed in scripture is active, resourceful, and constantly moving towards us. Our actions are not the sole action going on in the world. We could have the service of the acolyte. And then uh, either in spirit or standing, we'd like to have the call of worship. It's written by Dr. Lisa Hancock, Disciples of Ministries, March, 2023. Come, now is the time to worship. We come to worship God who provides. When the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, God provided manna and quail. God provides in unexpected ways. Jesus tells a story of vineyard workers, some who work all day and some who work mere hours, yet the generous landowner paid all of them equally. God provides in unexpected ways. God does provide in unexpected ways, yet manna, quail, and grapes need gathering and harvesting. We respond to God's provision by gathering and harvesting all God provides. Come, now is the time to worship. We come, come to, to worship, worship and partner with God who provides for the long haul. And then if you would join in the opening prayer, Lord who lifts us up, reside in our hearts today. Help us to listen closely for your word to us. Remind us that you are always with us throughout our lives. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may go into your world, ready to witness to your love through our works and deeds. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And our opening hymn is, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, number 121. There's a wideness in God's mercy. 
there's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in his blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's word. And our lives would be illumined by the presence of our Lord. Very well done. In the wilderness of our lives, God's grace is much like water flowing from a rock, transforming a desert into flowing rivers. And it's in thanksgiving for God's mercy that we give our abundance out of that abundance, a portion back for God to be multiplied for his use. So please join me as we prepare to bless those gifts by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. God of endless patience, we know that the sound of our complaining is not the music that makes your ears happy. We complain about the food that is under or overcooked, and you hear the stomachs that have no food. We whine about the bed being too soft, and you see instead those whose bed is a sidewalk or the floor of a cell. May the offering we bring today be an act of praise that drowns out the noise of our complaining. May it find its way to bring comfort to your children who have little or nothing. And when that happens, may it be joy for your eyes and ears. It is in Christ that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. There are always uh, people in situations that we do not feel we have permission or authority to share out loud and in public. So we go to God in silent prayer in order to share those first, and then we will all pray together. Heavenly Father, your blessings do abound in our lives, and we lift our voices in gratitude for each lovely gift from you, those that are known as well as those that are yet unknown. We also lift our voices as our hearts cry out in concern for those who are dealing with illness, who are mourning the loss of a loved one, for those who feel lost, and also for those who are curious. We offer to you both our joys and concerns because so often they are intermingled in our lives. Be with each one of us and those whom we name out loud and in the silence of prayer. You've heard our cries and our shouts of joy as well. Those times of celebration. And we ask that you would make your presence known to us again through the love and forgiveness of others as we have loved and forgiven them. We're called to be people of prayer, and so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now that we have 
reconciled ourselves to God, we can embrace that idea, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, because in that holy wisdom, we get to seek peace and welfare of one another as we rise and share the signs of Christ's peace in any way that makes us comfortable. As we make our way back to our seats, we're going to remain seated for this hymn as we prepare our hearts for the reading of God's word and also God's word proclaimed. We're going to turn to number 128 to sing together, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. find in your order of worship the prayer of illumination, which is adapted from 1 Peter 3.15, which is the basis of our message series. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today about the need to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts and be ready always to give a defense to anyone asking about the hope we have, doing so with gentleness and reverence. Amen. We're gonna begin the readings in the book of Exodus. We're gonna be reading chapter 16 and I'm actually gonna start with verse one to 15 and I'm gonna be reading from the message paraphrase. I encourage you always to read all three passages at any point during the day or during the week in your own Bible. And as you can see, it's on the study guide as well at the top. You'll always have the same thing on the first page so that anyone who visits and uh, for one time can see what the apologetics is all about. The back page of the study guide is always our new stuff. So just wanted to make sure I pointed that out. So in this passage, the Israelites on Exodus in the wilderness complain because they have no bread. They're being led out of slavery. They're being led by God to the promised land, but they don't have bread or specific food. And so miraculous bread enough for a day is given by God to sustain them. So hear these words. On the 15th day of the second month after they had left Egypt, 
The whole company of Israel moved on from Elam to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. The whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. The Israelites said, why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You've brought us out into this wilderness to starve us to death, the whole company of Israel. God said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread down from the skies for you. The people will go out and gather each day's ration. I'm going to test them to see if they'll live according to my teaching or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they have gathered, it will turn out to be twice as much as their daily ration. This, of course, was because he will not provide it the seventh day because the seventh day is for rest. Moses and Aaron told the people of Israel, this evening you will know that it is God who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of God. Yes, he's listened to your complaints against him. You haven't been complaining against us, you know, but against God. Moses said, since it will be God who gives you meat for your meal in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, it's God who will have listened to your complaints against him. Who are we in all this? You haven't been complaining to us, meaning Moses and Aaron. You've been complaining to God. Moses instructed Aaron, tell the whole company of Israel, come near to God. He's heard your complaints. When Aaron gave out the instructions to the whole company of Israel, they turned to face the wilderness. And there it was, the glory of God, visible in the cloud. God spoke to Moses. I've listened to the complaints of the Israelites. Now tell them at dusk you will eat meat and at dawn you'll eat your fill of bread and you'll realize that I am God, your God. That evening quail flew in and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew all over the camp. When the layer of dew had lifted, there on the wilderness ground was a fine flaky something, fine as frost on the ground. The Israelites took one look and said to one another, manna. They had no idea what it was. So Moses told them, it's the bread God has given you to eat. And these are God's instructions. Gather enough for each person, about two quarts per person. Gather enough for everyone in your tent. It's important to know that the reason you see what is it in parentheses, that is what manna means. They were literally saying, what is it? And so that is the name that stuck. Our second reading comes from the book of uh, Philippians. It is chapter one, verses 21 to 30. And in this letter, Paul is urging the Philippians to live lives worthy of Christ, to see their times of suffering, those, the effort and the pain and all of the things that they go through for Christ, not as an inconvenience, not as a punishment, but actually as given for the sake of their gospel witness. And I think that it's because, you know, it's easy to be impactful and, and charismatic when everything's right with the world and everything's going your way. But when you're taking on a lot of flack and you're still positive and you're still going out there and saying the same things you would if, as if the world were going right for you all the time, that is much more impactful. So hear these words. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart to be with Christ, for that is much, very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, 
but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. And our final passage comes from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, reading again, as I did with the last one, from the New American Standard Bible, a word-for-word translation of the original language. Jesus helps us understand the kingdom of God and the nature of God through parables, but parables often don't make sense to us because we pay attention to the wrong thing. For instance, the parable of the, the prodigal son should have been named the prodigal son's father because the main character is the father, but we tend to focus on the sons and we take it a little too literally. So in this one, I want you to understand that Jesus is trying to answer a question that came to them, to, to him from Peter in the passage right before this. Basically, Peter said, you know what? We gave up everything to follow you. So what are we going to get from this in the kingdom of God? Okay. And he says, well, you're going to do many different things, but the first will be last. In many cases, the last will be first. And then he launches into the parable. So I want you to focus on the main character who is the owner. And I don't want you to lose sight of what the purpose of a vineyard is. Why do we have a vineyard? Okay, so here are these words. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he'd agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and he said to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love the first reading from Exodus because the Israelites are doing that really mysterious, miraculous thing called romanticizing the past. And it is a sincerely extreme case of romanticizing the past, given the fact they were enslaved in Egypt and believe me, the last things that they thought about every day was how well they eat when they were enslaved in Egypt. So what is it that causes us to romanticize the past? Psychologists discovered that when people think back to events in the past, they remember the evaluation they gave it, but they don't necessarily remember the reasoning or the context. For instance, there were movies I saw in high school that I thought were the best movies ever, or even elementary school. Star Wars, best movie ever, uh, compared to all the movies I'd seen <laughs> thus far. So now, it, you know, 55 years in, it takes a little bit more to impress me and leave me in awe when it comes to a movie. And anybody relate to that? 
Okay, so if you know the first thing, there were really great movies back when we were in you know, high school in the late 1900s, but we decide that they must have really been better because we don't acknowledge the other thing, the second thing, that well, there was reasoning in context of a 15-year-old versus a 55-year-old. We can actually fool ourselves into believing it actually was better. But there's never been a time since the garden where life was just a bowl of cherries. In reality, we have never had perfect, amazing, wonderful days. There's always been something. Always. So the Israelites are stuck between this familiar history that was and what God has in store. And they remember food, but not in the context of the mistreatment that came with it. Paul writes to the church in Philippi to urge a reconsideration of how they view picking up, handling, and doing for Christ. Not as a, an inconvenience, but as a glorious use of time and resources for the greater good that God has planned. And then Jesus uses the illustration of a vineyard where the most valuable commodity in ancient Israel is grown, grapes for wine. That was the most valuable thing. And he's using it in order to describe, once again, describe God. But once again, when you hear that parable, who do you tend to focus on? The workers. Because we can more easily relate to them. So last week we began this series meant to equip you to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you those difficult questions, the ones that were asked so often, that we don't just give them a pat answer or say, well, it's in the Bible, you can go and read it for yourself. We have to be able to be ready to give the reason for the hope we have in Christ and always with the utmost courtesy. We're defending our faith, not being defensive about our faith. And we're instructed in 1 Peter 3.15 to be ready to give apologia, to give a defense for our faith. The question we look at today comes in many formats because why don't we get what we deserve can be a lament. Why don't they get what I think they deserve can be another lament. And as children, we learn that things, you know, life is not fair. As children, we would get upset and stomp our feet and say, Sally got more ice cream than I did. Well, Sally's 17 and you're seven, right? The one who is the giver of the ice cream, who brought the ice cream, who worked to pay for the ice cream, gave the ice cream, right? And they had their reasons for giving what they gave. As adults, we have those occasions in life when we're passed over for a promotion or a raise that we really feel that we deserve, and, and we can have those same feelings of it's unfair. But God's idea of fairness is very different from ours, and that's a very good thing because we can't see the whole picture. There was a time when I worked very, very hard in the hopes of having a promotion and a raise, but I would have settled for the raise. I didn't get it. And I didn't feel that the person who got it worked as hard as I did, and it was true. But they were also just found out they were expecting another child. If you don't understand the whole picture the way that God does, you're going to pray a certain way. And so I'm going to share with you a quote that, uh, from the late Timothy Keller that speaks to this idea and kind of is a good way to, to move into the next part of this message. He said, God will either give us what we ask for in prayer or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything he knows. It's good to know what happens right before Jesus tells that story, and I, I want to read that to you. I kind of gave you a little bit of a taste of it. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Is that a bad thing? 
when you hear it, it kind of makes you think it's a bad thing because when we hear first and last, what do we think of? Competition. Why? We've been drilled to think of it as competition. The devil has a way of taking language and distorting it to make us think of it in a different way than it was intended. Now, I thought a lot about this, and here are some thoughts. I'm going to give them to you, and you can measure them according to what you feel. But this, first of all, we're going to start with what is fair. So Merriam-Webster says that fair is marked by impartiality and honesty, free from self-interest, prejudice, or favoritism. In the assertion from those first crew people complaining and grumbling, were they concerned with fairness? So the last shall be first. I'm just going to spell this out. And these were my thoughts this week. Take them or leave them. The, first, the last shall be first. They haven't worked as long in the vineyard. And remember, God sends them out. It doesn't say God makes them work. God sends them out. They go out and they work. They didn't work as long. They don't necessarily feel as deserving of the kingdom of heaven, but they're blown away by God's generosity. Now let's think about the repentant thief on the cross. Someone else that people generally have a problem with. The thief was not remembered for the crimes he committed, but for the generosity he received from Jesus. Because he did earnestly repent of his sin, and he asked Jesus to remember him when he entered the kingdom. And the thief entered the kingdom before the disciples did. He was definitely considered last, but he went into the kingdom first amongst all of those who were present at the cross, beside Jesus. Shortest ministry ever is that repentant thief on the cross, and yet God used him. He changed his mind and he changed his heart, and we'll talk about that next week. But that thief was not remembered for his crimes. He's known as the repentant thief. And then the first shall be last. Don't get confused and think that means last place. It doesn't mean thought of last, thought of as less. The last ones out see more than the first ones do. They get to watch the creative, resourceful love of God transform others. They get to share with God the joy in that harvest. So I'm going to retell that story to see if that notion has any merit. A gentleman owns a vineyard and harvest time has come, which means we have an opportunity to harvest many thousands of grapes because they're all ready. Typically, the entire farm is run by just a few hardworking people, but harvest time is different because you need a lot more hands to be able to pick each and every grape in the time necessary to yield the best wine. When those grapes are ready, they need to be taken. So the owner, not a servant, the owner goes and seeks the laborers. The owner goes to the laborers. They agree on a wage, and they jump in the back of the wagon, and they head out to the vineyard for a long day of work. They are delighted. When they got up that morning, they had no idea how they were going to earn anything. But now they know they've got the jingle in their pocket. They can hear it. A little later, the year-round crew come and say, we need more hands, and so the owner goes out again, seeking more workers. 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 5 p.m., work ends at 6 but those grapes, they need to be taken. Each time the owner goes out to gather as many willing to work for the day's wage to bring in the grapes, he finds people with less and less and less hope. Less hope that they're going to find fruitful work. And so they're truly grateful for the opportunity, even the, 6 PM, even the 5 p.m., the last crew, grateful for whatever it is that they can get for that work. And so 6 o'clock, the workers line up. They're prepared to get paid. And it's that last crew at the front of the line. And they're going to get paid. And the owner gave them the same denarius wage for fewer hours of work. And that news starts to spread down the line. And what are they saying? Oh, boy. 
If the owner gave the ones who only worked an hour a whole denarius, I can't imagine how much more he's going to pay us. They made an assumption that the wage they agreed to isn't what they should get. They were entitled to more. They wanted status. They wanted to be treated differently. Now, all day they looked forward to that wage in their pocket while, beating, while working in that beating sun, and the wage was the best thing to happen in the morning, and somehow, hours later, it's an insult. So they demand an explanation, and they get one. It's my money and my business, and I'll do with it what I want. Doesn't delight the ear, yet haven't we at one time or another had to explain why we did with our own resources what another found insulting. They wouldn't have done it that way. Well, you did it that way, and you had your reasons for doing it that way, true? The vineyard didn't exist to make workers happy. It exists to make wine, as the owner intended. And as hard as that explanation was to hear, the next part was just as tough. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. They were compensated for their day, some having their prayer for meaningful work answered early in the day, first thing in the morning, who spent the majority of their day knowing they would have money for dinner tonight. They would be okay for a while, while some spent the majority of their day losing hope, the hope that they would have enough time to work to get enough money for dinner tonight. So whose day was really harder? Who's showing more empathy and compassion in the story? How quickly the early workers forgot their shared hope to find work desperate and hopeless, just like every one of those crews, and how the offer to work was like music to their ears and the wage was awesome and they jumped at it, very grateful, and they never gave a thought to the year-round workers. Our actions are not the only actions happening in the world, but we can become a little too wrapped up in it to remember that. And Christ reaches out to everyone born in sin, which is everyone, in order to offer the same salvation, even though what my sin, your sin, everyone's sin deserves is the wrath of God's judgment. Servants are sent out into the world by Christ to introduce people to Jesus first by the hope within that makes them curious enough to ask about it. And when they do, to keep in mind, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care about them. Part of the caring is to invite them to learn about Jesus with you so that they might develop their own relationship in time, accept that gift of salvation available to them. It's never too late. They may decide to die to the old sin self and be born again through baptism by water and the Holy Spirit and become servants filled with hope themselves. They might even be older than you and enter heaven before you. One of those last being first. They started later than you, entitled to the same wages as you. Remember the purpose of the vineyard was the wine and the purpose of discipleship is to fill the kingdom of God, not ourselves. And Jesus asks through the parable, if we can see the work through the eyes of God, that the point of the vineyard was to create the wine together, just as the point of discipleship is to fill the kingdom of God together. Another story about wine really came back flooding and leading to some of this. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus had the divine power to make wine appear, meaning he could have filled jars with wine. He could make that out of nothing. He had the power to fill empty containers that were just sitting there with wine. That's not what he did. What did he do? He asked the servants to get the jars, 
fill them with water, bring them to him. We learn the nature of God through what Jesus did, but also how he did it. And Jesus asked the servants to do those things, and they did. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, he turned the water. They poured into the jars into wine. And Jesus instructs a servant. He doesn't do it himself. Jesus instructs a servant to take the wine to the steward for inspection. And the servant does as instructed. The steward is confused as to why the best wine he'd ever tasted wasn't served first, which was how it was done. Divine things are always better. Of course, divine wine is going to taste better. And the servants get to offer them that best wine to all of those guests. You know, God wants servants to participate in the miracle. And God wants us to participate in filling the kingdom of God. And Jesus never asked those servants to do anything they couldn't do, did he? The guests had no idea where the wine came from, but the servants did. They knew that this was the most amazing wine. The first class wine came last. Didn't matter because they were grateful. And the servants were in awe. God calls each of us to be part of creating something new. It doesn't matter your age, your ability, or your health. With God's grace and mercy for us, no matter where we started in life or how old we were when we first believed, we get to go out in the mission field with the Holy Spirit, knowing God has already gone ahead of us to make new wine possible. Before all of those servants ever got into that vineyard, seeds were sown. The vines were cared for. It was, as Jesus says in, other, in another part of the Bible, to the disciples, you are going to go out and reap where others have sown. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, today we give thanks that we are here. We're here in church, attempting to worship you and to listen to you and focus on what you're trying to say to us. And then we're going to go out and we're going to try to serve you because you put us here. In some way, you found a way to appear to each of us and draw us closer to yourself and also to keep us close to you. And because you haven't left the significance of each of our lives up to us because you keep coming to us, often when we least expect it, maybe even when our hope is waning, we give you thanks for your active, resourceful love working among us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you please rise and body your spirit as you feel led to sing together our closing hymn, number 593, Here I Am, Lord. Stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. 
God's people in our heart. We celebrate what God is doing in the world that we cannot see, like hearts of stone becoming hearts for love alone. I know I don't deserve God's grace. It's a gift that makes me truly grateful to carry the water for Jesus and be a small part of or witness to the miracles making the best wine knowing that one faithful day, we, along with all the saints who've gone before us, to rejoice together over God's kingdom harvest. Till next week, go forth into God's world as God's own children, and let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and intentionality of your deeds. Go with joy to serve the Lord, and know that God goes with you. Amen. Amen.